think you know it, sing it out. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. And would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. In the precious blood of the Lamb. Oh, thank you for singing good. Y'all be singing. It's good to see you here tonight. I'm glad you chose to come to the house of God to worship and sing and study. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to John chapter 3. Beginning in verse 22, John chapter 3, verse 22. Remember last week we did the story of, of Nicodemus, the first 21 verses really of the third chapter of John. Now the scene is going to change dramatically. Uh, John sees this group, him included, are moving and moving. So we'll finish this chapter with a different scene here. Verse 22 says, after these things, that's the things that just took place, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now, very interesting verse. They are in Judea. They're in Jerusalem. But if, again, to belabor the point, if you'll look at your Bible maps right out past Revelation, out there in the back, uh, you'll see that to the right of Jerusalem, that would be east and a little northeast, there is a, a place near the, the sea of, I mean, near the uh, Jordan River, where some springs are and, and uh, that feeds into tributaries that feed into the Jordan River, and that is countryside. There's not a town related very close to that, so that's what J John means here. They went out into the land of Judea, and uh, there he remained with them. Jesus remained with his disciples, and it says there was baptizing took place. Now, we're going to see here in another verse in a little bit that Jesus himself physically did not baptize and there's a reason for that. We'll relate to that in a moment. But there was baptizing going on. Now, verse 23 says that John, that's John the baptizer, not John that wrote this book, also was baptized in Anon near Salim because there was much water there. Now, that makes a lot of sense. You've got to have enough water deep enough to immerse somebody because they didn't walk out there and do this Methodist splashing thing. You know what I'm saying? They, they immerse them. There is great symbolism of that. And those of you, uh, including nearly everyone here that are Christians, you know what that is symbolic of, the immersion, dying to old self and rising to walk in newness of life. So there was a good bit of water there. I'm sure at times of the year there was much of the Jordan River and many of these streams even that were almost dried up, and so there was not a possibility. So, so right here they're baptizing. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Now, if you were blessed enough here tonight to have one of those Bibles that has Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John parallel, uh, I have one somewhere, but I haven't seen it in 20 years. 
you'll find that John alone says this, and I believe the reason he said it was because the other Gospels are concentrating on John being arrested and then subsequently being beheaded. And there's not a good timeline with them to determine between Jesus' baptism and temptation and the first miracle and this kind of stuff, what John was doing uh, up until the time when he was arrested. So John, the gospel writer, fills that in for us. He was out there outside of Jerusalem some number of miles in this region that was countryside and he was preaching the word of God and telling about Christ and baptizing people. He had not yet been thrown into prison, which subsequently led to his death. Now, verse 25, interesting, interesting here. There arose a dispute between some of, not all, see, just some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. These Jews that were so self-righteous, the ones that were so religious, they were, they were really interested in baptism as a symbol of purification. I think I mentioned a week or two ago when, when some uh, pagan or heathen person of another religion desired to become a Jew, then uh, they were baptized as a proselyte of Judaism, and they went through this purification uh, rite. Uh, the Jews were big on this purification. Remember the first miracle at that wedding, there were all these pots, water pots there. That's what they were for, was purification. They, this was symbolic. And so between some of John's disciples and some of these Jews, there was a dispute that had come up. And then it boiled over in verse 26. It says, and they came to John, uh, this is John the Baptist, uh, uh, and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan... To whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. So this dispute has boiled over, and now they've included Jesus and his disciples in this situation. I don't know how far apart geographically they were. Nobody knows, and it's not that important. But they were close enough geographically that word had spread that not only John and his disciples were in this region baptizing people. But Jesus and his disciples were also in that region baptizing people. And there's a little bit of hyperbole here in the latter part of verse 27 when it says, Behold, he is baptizing, that means Jesus, uh, by proxy, his disciples, and all are coming to him. Y'all ever used exaggeration when you speak about stuff? Just, you know, like it's raining cats and dogs? No, it's not. It seems like it could because it's just an inundation. Uh, hyperbole is when you just, you just uh, children do this all the time. They just get so exasperated and just flow out with these words about, well, it's, it's everybody's doing it, that kind of thing. No, they're not. And they're not all going to Jesus. There are still people being baptized every day by John the Baptist. And so it creates this kind of a, uh, a, a, a dissension is basically what it does. Now I want you to notice the words coming up, this beautiful, precious attitude that John has. He understands exactly what his role in life is. He's known it always. And no, no disciples around him that are all flustered, no king that's going to kill him, nobody's going to change that. He knows he came to this earth as a prophet of God to foretell the coming of the Messiah. And that is an important role, and that's the only role he desires. He does not desire fame or fortune. He does not desire credit in any way for baptizing people uh, to repentance. He is here for one purpose and one alone. So look at these beautiful words. A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. John is saying, everything I've got, everything I would ever have, anything I would ever accomplish, came straight from God. Isn't that a beautiful attitude to have? Uh, I was telling somebody today, there's, there's all this upheaval in our nation right now. It's just such a crazy thing. And I, I think I said three or four times, God is in control. And there's, 
no matter what happens and how we view it and stuff, he is in control. And, and it's a wonderful attitude I think we all ought to have to trust in him. John says, it's going to be all right. Everything I've got came from him, and whatever he wants me to have, I'll have. You yourselves bear me witness, and I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. I think probably many times people look to him as a Messiah, or maybe Elijah, or one of the other prophets, and he said, I'm not the Christ. I'm just sent before him. He was a herald, herald or a, a, a proclaimer of who Christ was. And he illustrates that by a cultural thing with these people. We'll try to bring it down to our thoughts here in a moment. I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. In, in their wedding ceremonies, apparently, the, uh, what we would call today the best man would be the friend of the bridegroom, and in their ceremonies, it was his role was much more detailed. Today, I guess about the best thing that the best man can do is just to not stumble when the pastor comes out with the rest of them and probably hold a ring somewhere, and that's all they do. But in Jesus' day, the bridegroom really made the arrangements for the food and the wine, sometimes the location where things were to be during that week-long festivity, and to see that all of the uh, uh, accoutrements of the ceremony were set in place. So he had a big job to do. And he was the best friend of the bridegroom. But when time came for the wedding, and the bride and the groom got together, he was in the background. He was not up there in the front. He was not up there with the first of the picture taking. He was in the background. His job had been pretty much completed, and he melted into the scenery. But he, looked, he stands back there, and he's got joy on his face because the job he has done has been fulfilled. The job he was assigned to has been fulfilled. What a blessed thing that would be to, to sit back and see this take place. John says, that's, that's what I've done. That's what I've done. And he says, verse 30, He must increase, but I must decrease. And John's trying to get those, this over to his disciples. Don't be so worried and upset because of the things you see going around. I am on the decline, and Jesus is on the increase. That's the way it has to be. That's the way it has to be. He who comes from above us is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He's comparing himself here to Jesus who came from heaven in the form of a man, and John the Baptist, who was born just simply a man on this earth, and he speaks of earthly things. He who comes from heaven is above all, and what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. Jesus came from heaven. He came to spread the word of God. He is above all, and the wealth of knowledge and wisdom that he has is above anything that anyone else could have. And the heavens would only reveal the counsel of Jesus Christ in this way. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture here that John's painting for them. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. That there's truth. There's truth mentioned in your, in your Bible right here. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. He means here, when God gives his Holy Spirit, he gives it all the way. He doesn't give just a little bit. This is a great transition here from the Old Testament. Do you know how the Spirit functioned in the Old Testament? God's Spirit would, would come upon a people or a person or a group of people for a particular time in a particular place and do mighty work among them, and then would receive. He came and he went. He came and he went. But with the advent of Jesus Christ on this earth, and then when Jesus died and was resurrected and went back to be in heaven with his Father, the Holy Spirit is here as our comforter forever and ever and ever. So there is no lack of the Spirit. He's not given by measure. He is given completely. And by the way, Again, 
as I wear you out. This is another one of those places you can put some little parentheses. Here's a place where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are mentioned in just two lines in your Bible. Verse 35, the, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. He's really repeating what He said in the earlier part of this chapter in John 3, 16. He's given all things into Jesus' hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now that is a very important verse. Again, you'll see the parallel there with John 3, 16. This is a very simple verse, and it's given in Reader's Digest language. Even a 6th or 7th grader can read this and understand it. And that's why the Gospel of John is so precious for a new Christian. He who believes in the Son, that's Jesus Christ, has everlasting life. That's very simple. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, everlasting life is what he's alluding to, and life, period, in general, the, the joy of being alive, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now that's a very curious phrase, and this is one of the uh, things that so many people of the world have in their mind, that God is a cruel and vindictive God, and even the ancient Jews believe this to some extent, and if you do bad, He will swat you down. And if you do good, He'll bless you. But if you do bad, He's going to do bad things to you. Like God is, is vengeful in that regard. But what I see in this phrase is this. God has pronounced, not, he doesn't explode in anger, he has pronounced judgment on the unjust. He's pronounced judgment on the unjust. And if a person rejects Christ, thereby positioning himself as unjust, he has placed himself under the wrath of God. He's placed himself under the wrath of God. He has fallen into that which he could have avoided. God doesn't, doesn't put it on him. He decides to go in there, and the wrath of God then is upon him. I hope that's clear to you. Let me give you a simple example. That's, it's a little bit rough if you love animals, and I really love animals. But, you know, all my adult life I've cleared land and, and burned brush and, and plowed and built ponds and lakes and stuff, and one day I had some big old brush piles, and y'all ever been around a big old brush pile when it's burning, kind of like this one down here on the property? Man, that's a thrill to set something like that. I mean, flames going up 50 feet in the air. Well, I had, uh, I had a big old brush pile burning like that, and I mean, it was raging. And I was backing up to get a few more trees to put on it, and out came a little bunny rabbit. A little bunny rabbit, a little cottontail bunny rabbit. There were 20 acres he could have gone to. He ran straight into that fire. I've never, it's the only time I ever saw that in all the 40 years I've burned brush and stuff. I, I just I stopped the dozer. I could not believe it. I mean, he could have run to the left. He could have run anywhere and hidden, but he ran straight into that fire. He just disappeared into it. And, of course, he was obviously killed instantly. Did, did the fire chase him down and swat him down because he was a bunny rabbit and didn't have enough sense to avoid it? No. He ran into that. That's, that's what this verse means. You, you turn your back on Christ. You hear the word of God and, and the scripture is revealed to you and God's spirit is calling you. Here is the way of salvation. Join in with it. And you say, no, I want no part of it. That burning brush pile is waiting for you. It's just sitting there. And you'll go right into it. And that's the way I, I view that. Now, we're going to change the scene again. This is one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. Isn't he precious? I'm telling you what. They just don't get any cuter than that right there. Now, when he's 15, it may be a little different. You know, I'm, I'm just saying. But... He, right now, he is adorable. What a child, what a child. This story of the woman at the well is one of the most interesting stories in the whole Bible. 
It is a story of salvation, very much like the story of Nicodemus, but with completely different uh, context. So let's get into it and see what happens here. I'm sure you've heard Booney preach it, and you've heard others, and you've studied it, but it's a wonderful, wonderful scene. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, and then in parenthesis it says, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples. Now let's stop for a moment. There's a comma there. We can pause a moment. Did you ever wonder why Jesus didn't do any physical baptizing? I think there's a very good reason for that. John baptized. John was a man who came from the earth and entered back into the earth, and he physically baptized. And while he preached the baptism of repentance, Jesus preached the baptism of repentance and renewal and regeneration. And it, it, was, a, it was a change, a subtle difference. And Jesus himself did not do the baptizing to signify that he was from above, it wasn't that he was too good to do it, but it's, it's that he was from above and John was from down here. And that set them apart as far as their ministries were concerned. It's a very subtle thing, but that's why it's put in here. That's why John, the gospel writer, put this in here. Now, also fascinating is the first part of that verse, first verse. Therefore, when Jesus knew, it's not like Jesus woke up one morning and he said, Oh, no. The Pharisees are going to create a problem. There's going to be some difficulty. We've got to get out of here. No, Jesus was never surprised. John, the gospel writer, just put these words in there to let us know that Jesus knew what was going on all this time. And the Pharisees, throughout his whole three-year ministry, were a thorn in his side. And he had been down in Judea long enough and in the region of Jerusalem long enough. And if you read the other gospel writers, you'll see some of the things that John didn't include that he's already had interaction with these Pharisees, and he is deciding that since his time has not come to be captured and arrested and done away with, he's going to leave the country. He's going to move. And so verse 3 says, He left Judea and departed again to Galilee. Now before we read verse 4, uh, I, I don't know, it's about 80-something miles, I believe, 80, 85, 82, or 3 miles to the region of Galilee, that little lake. It's not even as big as Cedar Creek Lake, the Sea of Gennesaret, uh, right up there, up on the upper end of the Jordan River, from down near the Dead Sea where he was, out in that countryside. And that region, from where he is, north of Jerusalem, up to where Galilee is, almost to where Galilee is, was a country called Samaria. Now in the days of the kings, David and Solomon, especially when the kingdom was united, this was all just God's people. But after Solomon, the kingdom got divided, the kings got all mixed up, and so there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And that northern kingdom, uh, they fell into disrepair very quickly, and God allowed the Assyrians to come and overthrow them. Now the southern kingdom did not suffer that for a long time, and they suffered it from the Babylonians. But when, when the uh, Assyrians came, they took all of the, uh, I guess you'd say smart people, the, the people that were higher up, you know, business people, doctors, people that were versed in the law, learned people, people that could read and write and, and do all these great crafts and everything, and they exiled them. And they either imported or allowed to be imported uh, what I would call knuckle-draggers. Y'all know what a knuckle-dragger is? That's a redneck term for somebody that's just not, you know, they're, they're one brick short of a load. And uh, these people came in. Well, there were still some Jews there, not the really smart Jews, because they had been taken away. And so these people that came in, and these not-so-smart Jews, over a period of years, they got together and married, and it, was, it wasn't, wasn't good. It wasn't good. These folks, uh, they had sort of a semblance of religion, but uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't very good. And they uh, eventually, by the time Jesus came along, they had decided that the only part of God's Word that was worth anything were the first five books that Moses wrote. So they didn't accept 
the law or the, I mean, the, the prophets or the, uh, the praise, any of that stuff. They didn't believe in it, just the first five books. And uh, they had set them up a place to worship. They got run out of the Jerusalem area, and so they had gone up there near Mount Gerizim, and they'd set them up a place to worship. And by the way, in uh, 138 B.C., some Jews came up from the south and burned the place, burned their temple down, because they, they just, I, I don't think we could understand the hatred that Samaritans and Jews had. A Jew looked at a Samaritan as a half-breed, a lower-than-life, literally a person that was not much better than a dog. And because of that attitude and the way they treated Samaritans, the Samaritans reciprocated. They hated the Jews. They considered them snobbish and uppity-uppity, and, and uh, their religion was pitiful because they believed all these prophets and all this poetry and all this stuff. And so there was a tremendous hatred. Now, Jews being Jews and I mean that because of their merchandising, if they needed to go from Jerusalem up to the region of Galilee really badly, they'd go straight through Samaria, but they didn't want to. They did not want to. If they had time, if their business or whatever they were going to do, or let's say it was time for Passover and they lived up around the Sea of Galilee and they needed to get to Jerusalem for Passover, they would either go all the way over to the Mediterranean Sea coast and come down that way, or they would cross over the Jordan River and come down that way and then cross back over and go into Jerusalem to avoid Samaria. They hated them that much. I don't think we have any parallel to that today. Uh, you, you might have seen it in some racial uh, connotations in this nation or other nations in the past, but I still don't think it was as deeply rooted as this hatred was. You have to understand all I've just said so you can understand what's about to take place. Because Jesus said in verse 4, he needed to go through Samaria. Now you remember, these men that are with him are new disciples. It's only been a few months since they have chosen to follow Jesus. And they still have within their minds this thought that we're going through Samaria and they avoided any contact with the people if they could but it's a long journey and you're going to have to have food and water but the contact was kept to a minimum but they didn't understand why in the world we have to go through Samaria but Jesus knew that there was a great work to do there so he came to a city of Samaria which is called Sychar and I believe from study that I've done on this in the past that there is still a village, I can't remember its name now, I think it's Askar or something like that, that is close to that same spot. It says it's near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, if you go back to, I believe it's Genesis chapter 12, somewhere along in there, we just we studied it a few weeks ago, months ago now. Uh, you remember this is a, a place that in Genesis was called Shechem. And it's a very, very famous place in the book of Genesis. This is where Abraham stayed a lot of his time. This is where he bought that little plot of ground from that man who lived there and had that, that place there. This is where many of the patriarch's families were buried this is the place they brought uh, Jacob back to when he died in Egypt to bury him. This is the place they brought Joseph's bones back to after the exodus from Egypt. So this is a very, very famous place. And Jacob, at some point in his life, and you can read this, and I forgot chapter and verse in, in Genesis, but he dug a well there. And best I can, I, did, when y'all were in uh, the Holy Land, did y'all see that well? Did you see Jacob's well? You don't think you did? Okay, it, it may have been too far uh, out in the countryside. It would, that's, what, that's what the West Bank is nowadays, if you're wondering what the West Bank is in modern times, and it's kind of disputed land even today. This well, the best I understand it, and I've read a lot about it, I've even seen pictures of it, it still exists today. Apparently when Jacob went to digging, or his servants, I don't think Jacob did any digging, but anyway... Uh, when they dug down uh, several feet, they hit water. 
And as they began to clean it up, it became apparent that that, that wasn't just a seep from the ground, that water was running through there. And it was actually an underground spring that they had found. And the, the picture you need to see is that water was just flowing through there, but it would, pardon, no pun intended, it would well up in that hole and pool there. Now, again, another one of my dirt moving stories. Only one time have I ever seen this. I was prospecting for some clay for a clay company about 15 years ago in a new place that they wanted to dig. And I dug down about four or five feet and I hit some really good brick clay. And so I told the fella that I, uh, he was there. I told him, I said, well, this is really good clay. And I dumped some out and they got some samples and stuff. And he said, well, we've got to test it and see how deep it goes to see if it's worth mining or not. So I went on down about four or five more feet. So I'm down about 10 feet now. And I dug another bucket up and the bucket just kind of, the soil just broke loose and I pulled it up. And I looked down in that hole, and there was sand down in there that was literally, I'm not exaggerating now, it was literally as white as snow. Where the clay ended, that sand started. And I pulled that bucket of clay up and looked in there, and he looked over in there, and the water was running, just like a stream out on top, just going through there. And that's the only, and when I saw that, I thought about this very verse. And within about, Within about two minutes, there was three feet of water in that hole. And he said, well, I guess we know how deep it is. And we never, he never did mine it because it was not thick enough. It wasn't profitable. So I filled the hole back in. And that's the only time I've ever seen that. So that's the picture I want you to get. This was a hole in the ground that you couldn't walk up to and reach out and get you some water if you had a, a dipper, a gourd or something. It was far enough down that you had to have some other means of getting it. And yet it was not a, a cistern like would collect rainwater with old dirty water in it. This was pure, fresh water. And I'm told it still runs today. Uh, there is no religious group that has ever been around there that does not acquaint that with Jacob's well. Even the Muslims do. They acquaint that with Jacob's well. The Bedouin sheep herders, the Jews, everybody that lives around there, that's Jacob's well. So the picture we get here is Jesus has gotten to that point outside the little village of Sychar. And he has made his journey from the morning until, now this is something that people discuss a lot, and, and I'm, it's, it doesn't matter, it doesn't change the story a bit in the world. I think this was noon. It says it was the sixth hour, but John normally equated his time with Roman time, which would not be this. But for some reason, it says the sixth hour. And the reason I think it was about noon is because we're going to read in a, in a moment that that woman came at a time of day when no other women were there. And the women came out of those villages, wherever they were, to a point where they could get water for their houses either early in the morning while it was really cool or late in the evening when it was cool and off. They didn't venture out there in the middle of the day. And we'll more about that in just a moment. So Jesus is sitting here by this well. I'm sure there were some trees growing around. It was like an oasis. And he's just sitting there. Been, out, been walking all day long, ten or six hours. He's been up walking. And the woman of Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So they were not there. It was just Jesus and this woman. And he says to her, give me a drink. Y'all see anything wrong with that? In, in the day in which they live. Now we, we have gotten way past that in our culture today. But I can remember a time... Uh, when men did not speak to women in public who were strangers unless they needed directions to go somewhere or something like that. I can, I can remember that was when I was a little bitty boy. It was, kind of a, it was just kind of something you didn't do. Of course, we didn't do a lot of things there. We didn't eat with our hats on, and we asked blessing for our food before we did that. You know, there's lots of things we used to do we don't do anymore, open doors for people and things. But uh, a Jewish man especially a rabbi, would not even speak to even a Jewish woman in public, even his wife, unless it was absolutely necessary. 
he might ask her a question or give her some instruction in a very soft voice, but he would not even speak to another Jewish woman. He certainly would not speak to a heathen woman, one outside of the religion of Judaism, and he certainly wouldn't speak to a Samaritan woman. In the order, the patriarchal order, men are at the top, uh, their children are next, their wives are way down here, and that's debatable. Their, their oxen and camels may be a, a little bit above the wife. So you see where women were in this society? And Samaritan women were the lowest of the low, and he would never have spoken to one except he did. And he said, give me a drink. Can you imagine the shock in her mind? She goes out there in the middle of the day with her water pot because she didn't want to face these other women that were going out there because she's not a, a, a woman of really high class in their culture even. And she comes up there and there's a man sitting there and she knows by the clothing that he's wearing that he is a Jew. And it's, it's a miracle, I think, that she didn't just turn around, but she needed water, see. She couldn't just turn around and go back to the village, so there's a, there's a quandary here, a, a problem for her. She needs water, but there's a Jewish man sitting right by the well. And more than that, when she approaches, he says, just right out of the blue, give me a drink. And I think he asked her in a very kind way like that. There's a, there's a real good lesson for witnessing here. You know what one of the keys for witnessing to lost people are out in the world? Now, you can go up and just lambaste them with the gospel if you want to. But one way to do it is just be really kind and inviting to them. And strike up a conversation with them about virtually anything and see if God's Holy Spirit doesn't lead it to where you can then open up an avenue of talk that would lead to more serious things. And that's something we need to cultivate if we're going to win people to Christ. And see, Jesus said, just give me a drink. Obviously, he's tired and hot. And the woman of Samaria said to him, and this is also almost miraculous because I think most women, if he spoke that of that day, they would have took off running because they'd scare them to death. But she said, now, now remember, we're going to talk about this woman's reputation in a little bit. This, this woman is, uh, she's had a troubled life, let's put it that way. And when people have, have had that kind of life that she's had, they're what we call hard people. And so she's going to come right back at him, which is very unusual. Normally in that day and time, a woman that was, a dress like that would have just literally, she'd have probably thrown her pot down and run. But this woman comes back and said, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She laid it right out there, didn't she? In other words, she's put, she put it back on Christ. Why in the world would you speak to me? A Jewish man, I'm a Samaritan woman. That just ought not to be. See, in her mind, if he's going to sit there, he needs to be quiet. Don't say a word. All I need to do is, is get my pot down there and get it full of water and put it back on my shoulder and head back to town. I don't need to talk to you. I don't even want to look at you. But he says, give me a drink and compels her to engage in conversation. So she came right back at him. How is it that you, a Jew, would ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? You see, a Jew would not have even... Uh, tasted water from anything she had, any dipper, any water pot, or anything, because he would consider it completely unclean, because she's unclean, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't have, have, if he was dying of thirst, he would probably not have taken water from her, but Jesus said, give me a drink. The Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, see, she put it all on the Jews. It wasn't all on the Jews. There was a lot of it on the Samaritan side, but now look at Jesus. He answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, God, and he would have given you this living water. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. And the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Now, this is a typical thing that will happen when you witness to people in the world. When you begin to get to the point where uh, I call it bearing down, where you, you present the need for salvation in their life, if they don't know Jesus, then almost invariably 
they will jump off the train onto another track somewhere and say this, that, and the other. They'll say things like that, and I know those of you that are witness have had this. They'll say things like, well, I'm just as good as so-and-so, and he goes down to your church. I've seen him in blah, blah, blah place, and he goes to your church. Or I saw one of your deacons the other day, and he was just cussing like a sailor. Or I just couldn't believe in a God that would kill all those Canaanite babies. They're going to they're gonna jump off on something else instead of the burden of their own personal salvation. That's just so typical. And that's what she's done. She's, she's going to change every time she gets a chance here. And Jesus said, if you would have asked him, he would have given you living water. And she said, sir, you don't have anything to draw with. And the well's deep. She's going back to this physical thing. She's looking forward to that living water he's talking about, but how is he going to get it? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from him himself as well as his sons and livestock? So she's really coming back at him. She's kind of snapping at him. It's a really interesting thing. And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now what he has told her here is that I'm not talking about this water. This water that you put in your pot and go back to town, you'll, you'll need some more tomorrow. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about water that cleanses your soul and changes who you are and you would never thirst again. And he's talking about soul thirst here, not physical thirst. But she still doesn't get it. He tells her if, he, if she has this in her, that her life will be a wellspring of everlasting water. But she says, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Did you know the church, maybe not so much today as it was a hundred years ago, drew people just to be in a place to see what other people were doing. And occasionally you'll have people that do that today, but there's so much entertainment and, and outside stuff today that people's minds are just scattered. But a uh, hundred years ago, people would hear a church bell and they'd say, you know, I'm going to go down and see what they're doing down there today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna do that. Chris Christopherson wrote a song back oh, 40, 45 years ago. Uh, Sunday morning coming down. I know every word of that song. I've I listened to it a thousand times. And in that song, Johnny Cash recorded it, and many others have. He talks about hearing that church bell ring and going by that church and hearing them sing. Now that used to be something that drew people, but today it not not as much as it used to. But Jesus says, you're, you're still thinking about this physical water. I'm thinking about something that will, that will give you eternal life. She's wanting that. She's just wanting the physical water. And so Jesus sees that that's a, that's a dead end with her. She's, she's walled up, we call it. So he goes another track. Well, we're going to have to hurry. It's 751. Y'all don't mind if we stay to 8, do you? Okay. Uh, go call your husband and come here. Oh, now he has ripped the scab off a sore. Man, man, man. And the woman very, I think, arrogantly says, I have no husband. I can just hear her saying, I have no husband. She's proud of it. She's proud of it. There was a young lady came in the gun store a few months ago, and, and uh, she, she wanted something. She looked at two or three guns and thought about buying one. And, and uh, she said, now, when I fill out the form... Do I put my name I use now or the name on my license? And I'm standing there, what? And I said, well, we normally require that you put the information to exactly match your Texas driver's license. And she said, well, that's not my name now. And she said, in fact, I've been married so many times, I have trouble keeping up with what my name is. And I wanted to say, don't tell me too much more. I don't, I don't need to know anymore. But she did go on to tell me she had been married and divorced about three or four times, and the guy she was uh, living with at this time was not her husband. It's very much like this lady right here. Out there in the world. She said, I, I'm not married. I don't have a husband. And Jesus said to her, well, you've well said I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one of whom you have now is not your husband. 
in that you spoke truly. Now here is the kicker. She realizes now she's talking to somebody that's not a normal Jew. This man knows things about her that nobody else could know. And uh, if you look, in, and we we're going to get to it. We won't do it tonight, I don't think. We're going to try to get out through verse 26. But next week, I want you to know we're going to turn back to Isaiah chapter 11, the second and third verse. That's a wonderful chapter in the Bible, by the way. And we're going to find out that, that uh, there's some important things that take place in the prophetic work of Isaiah that have to do with Christ. But one of the things that's so important here is that uh, even the Samaritans were looking for a Messiah. And one of the clues that they had that he would come was the fact that he would know things that nobody else knew. And so her mind clicked a little bit when he said this. And she said, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. Now she's going to go off on another tangent with this religion thing. And I wish we had a little more time. We'd bear down on that. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Now she's talking about there where, where they had built their temple. And that's where they were worshipping. And then the Jews were worshipping down in Jerusalem. And she's all hung up on this worshipping at a place. And Jesus said... Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you'll neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, that you'll not worship the Father in either of these places. You worship what you do not know. Now that's harsh, isn't it? He says, you're worshiping what you do not know. Why? Because they took the first five books of the Old Testament and cast the rest of it out so they didn't have the prophecy of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And they didn't have the beautiful prose and poetry of David and the other psalmists they didn't have the wisdom of Solomon and so he's he's saying you don't even know what you worship you're worshiping something you don't even know about but we know and he's talking about Jews there we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews but the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will work but worship the father in spirit and truth I think a lot of people in the world have heard that phrase spirit and truth Let's see what it means. You see, it's a little s. It's not Holy Spirit. It's a little s. That's your spirit and my spirit. When we truly worship, our spirit is not only uplifted, but it's opened up to receive what God's spirit, the big S, has for us. And that's one reason that Pastor has mentioned more than once, many times in the years that I've been here, that people that will tell you when you go out and visiting, well, we don't come to church, but we watch it on TV, or I can worship out there in the bass boat just as good as I can in there, out in the beauty of nature. But the point is, you won't do it. You see, when you come together to worship, you're in with like-minded people, and your spirit opens up to receive the Spirit of God. You see it on the faces of people. I do sitting up here in the choir. And so when lost people come in and they're involved in this, they see this too. And God's Spirit has a place then He can work in their life. And so that's what He says. We worship the Father in, spirit, in our spirit. In our spirit. But a lost person doesn't have that capacity until God calls them and Jesus comes into their heart. But this is God's people doing that. And then truth. Now we know what truth is. There's only one truth and it's the truth of who Jesus Christ is, who he has always been. And there's only one truth, and that's the word of God. Um, I watched a video. Goodness, I wish we had another hour. Can you all stay late, 30? No, I watched a video, and you want to look it up on YouTube. It's Robert Jeffress. You know who he is, First Baptist uh, Dallas, pastor. used to be at First Baptist Wichita Falls. I followed his career for 20 years. He was in uh, with John McKay. I think he's with Channel 4, isn't he, or some, a news guy. Uh, he had this father so-and-so who's an Anglican priest and a homosexual, and he was debating Robert Jeffress. It's a four-minute video. Look it up. It is phenomenal. And that's what he was, he was playing the part, really, of this woman here. He kept coming up with things like that, and Robert Jeffress just kept bringing him back to the truth of God's Word. And he repeated over and over, like Billy Graham would say. He'd say, the Bible says, and God's Word says, and that fellow would say things like, well, I was born this way. And Robert Jeffers would say, well, I was born a man. And I've said this in my testimony many times. And he said, there are all kinds of thoughts that people have, but you don't have to act on them. There's nothing wrong with being a homosexual. There is wrong with being 
in the acts, uh, act of homosexuality. And that's the difference. And see, this is what the truth is. And people don't understand the truth of God's word today. Mostly because outside of churches like this, it's not preached. It's not preached. And so this is a very important point. We worship in our spirits God the Father. And the truth of his word then just enfolds within us. And we are not to vary from that. It, there is so much that's truly black and white. And it's the truth of God's word. Jesus said it in John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man can come to the Father except by me. Now, very quickly, let's finish down to verse 26. And we'll pick up with 27 next week. God is spirit. Now, see, that's big S. You see that in your Bible? These, these punctuation and these capitalizations are important. God is spirit. Now this is Jesus Christ talking about His Father and the Holy Spirit. So here again, you've got the Trinity. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit, little s, our spirit, the part that is us, and in truth. That's the only way you can worship God. Any other way is fake. Any other way is just show. Now look at verse 25. Here is this tremendous, triumphant verse. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. She has now admitted, he's got her to a point where she is admitting that she believes God is going to provide a way of salvation. And then John put in here, who is called Christ, and that's of course the Greek transliteration of the word Messiah. And then she says, when he comes, he will tell us all things doesn't this give you goosebumps? She's sitting in the very presence of God in the flesh at a well. And she says, and when he comes, he'll tell us all things. He's already told her all about herself. And then look at verse 26, and we'll close here. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Can you imagine the hush that fell over that place at that moment? To me, that's one of the most profound verses in the whole Word of God. I who speak to you am He. And when I have preached this as a preacher in years past, I've always ended up with, with this part. Of course, the rest of the story is wonderful, and we're going to look at it next week. But I ended up right here is that same Jesus is speaking to your heart today. What will you do with Him? What will you do with Him? Well, this, this is good stuff, isn't it? This Gospel of John. Man, I'm, I'm telling you. Next week, we're going to see about the disciples coming back. They brought some hamburgers and french fries and uh, some fast food in their little bags and couldn't figure out why Jesus didn't want any of it. This woman threw down her water pot and took off. Now, I ought to have piqued your interest enough to read ahead and see what happens. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. It's a beautiful day today. Brother Bill always reminds us we should be grateful of every day of life we had. But